sound of your city for 30 years. As promised, Jason Anderson is joining me by telephone to talk about shortcuts, short films from around the world playing at the Toronto International Film Festival uh, next month. Very happy to have him back. He did a great job last year of taking us through the short film programs. So let's get started with uh, program one. And there are eight programs. Yeah, we did eight. We're, we're slightly shorter than like uh, than last year. We had uh, like 11 last yeah. year. Yeah. A bunch of the festival. I mean, the festival has gone through a bit of a squeeze to make it uh, tighter and more amazing than ever. <laughs> so, so it was even it was hard doing this year's program because well, we had so I much was, good material. Yeah. Well, I I was going to say that it makes your work harder because you have less slots to to program these films and short films have gotten so good over the years. We're thrilled. I mean, we get so much great material from all over the world. And uh, and the and the number of films we get like, for submissions goes up every year as well because I think people there internationally know that uh, TIFF does international shorts along with the Canadian ones. So anyway, we had I think nearly forty three hundred submissions of just short films uh, to uh, for our team to wind its way through <laughs> to come up with I think fifty nine films and shortcuts this year. So that was that's tough. Yeah, <laughs> that's it is really hard. <laughs> now I want to jump to it and uh, threads. Uh, by Academy Award um, winner Toril Cove. Beautiful, beautiful film. Tell our oh, listeners know, about Threads. It? Yeah, it just is a lovely piece. People might know her name because she did win an Oscar for uh, animated short a couple of years ago for a film called The, Dan- the Danish Poet. She's a, a Norwegian-Canadian filmmaker herself. And it's just is Threads is this really lovely piece about sort of, I mean, in this kind of very kind of uh, signature hand-drawn style she has. Although I, I think it's quite a bit different film than other ones that she's done. This one's like kind of a wordless, um, very emotive kind of thing about sort of connection. And it's very much inspired by her own sort of relationship with her adopted daughter. And it's got this really like, it's, you know, kind of this really, you know, kind of simple but elegant kind of visual motif with these sort of red threads running between people in the film. And it just, it made me weep buckets. <laughs> it was one of, it was you know one of my three hanky movies this year you know what got (laughs) me with this film is how simple the drawings are simple Mm -hmm. lines and curves and color and the sound is incredible the sound design is magnificent and sorry go ahead and it it, as you said it just touches your heart it does it really it's it's so lovely and we're just always so excited to have this really really like super world-class Canadian animation work in the program. And, it's, and we are really excited about the animation selections we've got this year. Well, let's jump to another animation in Program 1, and that's um, an Imagine Conversation, Kanye West and Stephen Hawking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And this one was, was one of these sort of natural picks for us because there's so many jokes about Drake in this one. Yeah. Drake is kind of the... <laughs> A sort of a central. I mean, Kanye cannot stop talking about Drake, so that's a natural for us, I think. Yeah. Um, and Saul Friedman's another filmmaker we've had at the festival many times for these really ingenious shorts. Again, a very a kind of hand drawn style again, but very different. Uh, and this is, I think, part of a series that he's doing for FX TV about these sort of kind of ima- like like the title says these imagined conversations. In this case, you have um, Hawking and Kanye, and you know they're very quickly depart from any any reality we may recognize about these two people's lives but uh actually it's just so funny actually yeah. with kanye not so much maybe not kanye <laughs> it's, it's exaggerated but right? you know it's, it's kanye <laughs> thinking he's the best at everything you know that every, everything he touches just changes for the better <laughs> he literally has like a midas touch in his he does. He does. yeah he does he is he's, he's a he's a very gifted yeah. individual and i love how <laughs> i love how it all comes back down to drake <laughs> yes, always. So, but we're very happy. Yeah. yeah. Um, program two, um, mm. there is a Swedish short called Push It. Um, oh, yeah. Which I love. It's very oh, succinct. Oh, like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So fill in our like, audience. Oh, sure. And Push It, this is, um, this is a film uh, we saw at Cannes by a, a Swedish uh, filmmaker, sort of former uh, music video director named Julia Thalen. And uh, and this is a it, it's this basically this sort of portrait of a young uh, adolescent girl in her sort of 
physical education class and there's a boy that maybe she likes and there's just this kind of amazing tension and kind of you don't exactly know this relationship's going through it it's kind of like we we're talking about this with somebody recently and it's kind of like the message of the movie is kind of when it's almost like when when young women realize that they have to kind of maybe be not quite so special if they hope to keep the interest of the guys that they're interested in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's I know. A, it's it's sad. kind of a subversive, somewhat of a sad message, but it just it really just nails this particular kind of juncture in this, in this young woman, uh, woman's life. And, and it's one of these films, I mean, it's like seven or eight minutes long, and it really is one of these things where you really see how some filmmakers just have that knack where they just don't waste a single second. Like, this no. is everything... Everything in there is just like maximum impact, really smart, really ingenious, and really funny. And it sort of ends on one of my favorite uh, dance sequences, you know, kind of when it's hilarious. I remember talking to the filmmaker about the dancing and the, and the thing that kind of culminates in the sort of, sort of student dance routine. <laughs> she said they had to, she had to kind of really get those. It's been a long time getting them just like perfectly awkward. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're perfectly awkward, yet they think they're amazing. Of course. <laughs> Now, I jumped ahead too quickly to Program 2. I want to go back to Program 1, mm-hmm. just so people know it's not all animated. Um, oh, for sure. There is Bickford Park with one of my favorite Canadian actresses, uh, Leanne Balaban. Yeah, and that's a really fun. Uh, that's a w- wonderful thing we have from um, a Toronto team, uh, Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Stewart and Dane Clark. And they've done a bunch of really great films, and we're really happy to have this new one. And also, it's just like, again, it's like, you know, you can't get more Torontonian than a film called Bigford Park. Uh, and it is actually, you know, there's such the title is pretty much shot at Bigford Park and nearby. So, but it's just this really, I think it's another kind of a nice, it's a different kind of coming of age story. When we, we, we obviously get a lot of coming of age stories because we have a lot of young filmmakers submitting work and it's a natural subject for a lot of those people. But this one I thought was kind of an interesting thing because it's kind of like a kind of coming of adulthood story. Like it's like this. Leanne Balaban plays this young woman who is maybe getting 30 past 30 and not quite ready to sort of be a grown-up yet. So it's kind of like her, she kind of has this, you know, kind of not quite affair, but she kind of gets interested in this uh, teenage skateboarder, gives her a skateboarding lesson. And I think it's kind of this really, you know, very thoughtful, funny way of looking at this sort of moment in your, maybe your adulthood, where you're kind of realizing, oh, things are things are kind of different for me now. I kind of have to be a grown-up. I can't kind of pretend to be a teenager forever. Mm-hmm. And I love the song, Her Husband's. Her oh, husband's he's so sang. funny. I know, he really steals it, doesn't he? <laughs> oh, he steals it so much. And you're going, your song is awful. <laughs> it's like, he needs to grow up, too. It's like the both of totally. them, actually, you know, have to realize they're not in their 20s and anymore. They're not teenagers. It's like, they have to do a bit of, uh, there has to be some maturation happening. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and also in program one, um, another country represented besides Canada is uh, Slovakia with Magic Moments. Oh, I love this film too. This is like one of these things we just sort of saw and immediately loved. And I think it's, you know, it's funny just in this sort of coming of age type trip. I mean, it is something we get a lot of. You, you, certain get, you certainly get certain types of movies from some emerging young filmmakers, no matter where they are in the world. And certainly coming of age stories, stories about adolescence are always a big thing. And this one was, I thought, really notable and, and wonderful because it really, you have these, it's basically about this sort of, you know, girls maybe 14, 15, who is kind of stuck on her own because her parents are working somewhere else. And it's just basically her and her younger sister kind of taking care of themselves. And it's so gentle. And it's one of those things, too, where I'm just like so struck by how the people in the family actually love each other and treat each other kindly, which is <laughs> something after you've seen many, many movies where it's really just like the darkest view of humanity and cruelty and everything else. And you kind of get to these movies where it's like, wow, this is actually kind of like people regarding each other with kind of love and consideration. And that just becomes this like, it's so intoxicating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it It is refreshing to have that to have that change because everybody seemed to think that documenting angst is the way to go to make you know your family's better if you're documenting angst um, yeah and so it's, certainly... it, it's a nice difference mm-hmm. yeah. and I think it's really lovely just that kind of that nice light touch you know you really do have something you know it's, and it's, I think it's something that you know I think it, we one of my things I always say is it's like it's kind of not that hard to find great sad movies because there's a lot I mean mm-hmm. it's, and it, it's I think it is hard to find great stuff that actually has a, a wider variation in sort of tone and, you know, kind of is 
light without ever getting kind of saccharine or sentimental. And then you have a film like um, Everlasting Mom. I don't think I've ever seen a short film like this before. The Israeli it's film. It's something, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And this is um, it's a, it's a documentary sort of portrait of the filmmaker, uh, filmmaker making a film about her mother, uh, who is this like um, extremely like regal woman, and she kind of presents her as this kind of like almost like the sort of Joan Collins <laughs> dynasty kind of you know this figure of kind of wealth and 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 this very queenly and and the story just kind of gets richer and richer. It goes along sort of about this woman and you know or kind of uh, gets into sort of ideas about you know difference between generations of women. Um, sort of ideas about the sort of legacy of the Holocaust uh, and this family's lives, and, and it just is all these sort of surprising elements, but it just is this amazing kind of almost sort of glamorous view of femininity, and, but in this really, like, rich and surprising way. Very surprising. There's animation and there's music as well. And yeah, no, it's... It's really, it was really unexpected in terms of, you know, you're, as you follow along, you're introduced to something new, um, as the narration goes along with it. And that's it. Like, that's always a big factor for us as programmers, myself and Dennis Galay, my uh, programming partner. It's just, we want, we want surprises. Like, we want it, like, the stuff that's going to surprise us, we know, is sort of stuff that we're really excited to show audiences, you know, stuff that we kind of, you know, like, just, just sends us somewhere we hadn't expected. And we're always just suckers for that big time. <laughs> yeah. Now, in program two, there's a film that takes you someplace that you're not expecting, and it's called Wicked Girl. Uh, the Turkish film. Oh, it's a very, and that's a, it's it's a very powerful piece. I think too. I don't really want to give too much away about it, sort of subject matter, because it really does hit really hard, and it's it's about sort of inspired by a true story of sort of incidents and, and um, sort of things that children are going through uh, in Turkey, and uh, and this is, but it's just like such a stunning piece. I mean, it's also I think you know a really great example of where you have this kind of you know, uh, uh, films or animated films where you have kind of a child's perspective on something and it's based on a sort of child narration and, and you have this kind of free-flowing kind of mix of kind of fantasy and memory and other things and it gets, you really don't understand really kind of what it's what it's about until the sort of final moment and uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a stunning piece and this was um, something we saw early on and, and has already done, um, already won a prize at uh, Odyssey in France, which is the big animation festival in France, and, and it's something like, I think it's something like 10,000 uh, hand drawings to make the film, something ridiculous. <laughs> I'm always, it's it's uh, gorgeous. Uh, it's it gorgeous. is. And then you have the, the narration of the of the young girl and her, her her voice and how she jumps from subject to subject and, you know, talking about the different things uh, in her life, the summer she spends with her grandfather, and all of these things, and then at the end, when you put it all together is when you get punched in the gut, you know, oh, yeah. sort of um, unexpectedly. Uh, unexpectedly, but not really, because the hints are there as the film mm -hmm. goes along, but uh, definitely deserving of uh, any award that, uh, that it wins. Um, so uh, Wicked Girl is in program two along with Push It and there's an, uh, a New Zealand film with uh, two young boys and I just love this slice <laughs> of life with the two boys sitting by a pay telephone and then you know them just talking it is just a lovely piece it really is it's one of those things we just again kind of an adolescent type story that we just feel is, you know it's, it, it, it does something different and fun and poignant in a way that you just kind of kind of sneaks up on you too like it's and it's really it's great because we really and that's something we're really trying to you know, uh, find is really sort of really emerging um, indigenous filmmakers from wherever they are in the world and this is something that came from a Maori filmmaker in New Zealand that was just like really just had a, a you know great appeal and great impact to us even though it's kind of this super low key thing with basically just like Two boys hanging out by a phone. <laughs> yeah, cool yeah. Nothing else to do. Um, but there's meaning behind, you know, why they're why they're in that specific location. Um, so jumping on to program three of Shortcuts, the um, international uh, short film program at TIFF. Um, there's a Canadian film called For Nona Anna. And uh, it's such an adorable film, and Nona is so. I just want to wrap her in my arms. <laughs> I know. Oh, oh, it's such. It's so sweet. And we were uh, met the filmmaker recently, and 
um, and it's a, a they are a trans individual, and then this is one of a couple of um, films sort of about trans experience that we've got in the festival this year that we're really really excited about, and it's just uh, they told us this really just that this is sort of shot in in the home of the grandmother who inspired the story, and it just is it really it was, you'd feel all the emotion in this piece, like it really is something where you know the, the kind of the heart is on the sort of proverbial sleeves in a really big way. And yet it's still very, like, you know, very skillful and thoughtful. And this is an, definitely a filmmaker that we're really excited to kind of bring into TIFF and, and we'll think we'll do amazing things. Yeah, and I, I love the domestic point of view of this uh, uh, teenage girl taking care of her um, her old, her, her, her grandmother who's very frail and needs help around the house. And I, I love the fact that it's uh, in, in Italian and English. Because that's mm-hmm. what's was spoken in in so many of my friends' homes um, when they <laughs> because Nona lived at home with them. No, it does. It does really. Yeah, I mean, you get the real, got a real lived in because it's just you sort of, it's one of those films you see that just breathes the authenticity, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't it feels very much as a sort of a lived story. It doesn't feel like something that's kind of like really kind of labored and contrived or heavily written. It just feels absolutely sort of organic. Right. It's not heavily written. You're absolutely right. Another one that's not heavily written is uh, Creatura Dada with the beautiful, I love Alanis Morissette. I know. <laughs> <laughs> not Morissette, um, Obama Swain. <laughs> Wrong Alanis. Um, she is, I knew, that it's a short film with uh, these female uh, directors and, you know, they cut to, the sh- to a particular pair of shoes and I'm going, that's Alanis. I know those yeah. She's she is such a fashion plate. <laughs> she is so glamorous, and this is something that we just. I mean, it, this is like a really like short. It's like four minutes long, and it's just this kind of celebr. It's a very celebratory kind of film, and this is by um, Carolyn Monet, who's this amazing filmmaker. We've played many times at TIFF, and uh, is sort of like working a first feature, and and she's super cool. And this is just kind of like. It's just a, it's a, it's not, it's kind of like a film and a party. It's really, it's just like, <laughs> basically, Carolyn just kind of got some like amazing women, you know, Alan is included, and then, you know, kind of just shot them eating like, you know, eating lobster and drinking champagne and having these desserts. And it's just this kind of, this, you know, this kind of representation, especially of sort of indigenous women that we just we kind of starved for you know and, and we sort of in the media so i think it's just kind of a, a really kind of celebration of that sort of power and strength and glamour in a way that's really kind of radical in its own way yeah and i it's it's four minutes long it's uh i can't even remember if there's any dialogue is there any dialogue i don't think so I think it's just music and general party chat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, and the the power of these women come through, and all they're doing is eating, but the power comes through as they, you know, sort of, um, they ex- exude this sort of strength um, as they're feasting, which is brilliant. I know, and just so cool. <laughs> exactly, they're cool. Um, now, uh, Besides uh, Canada, again, being represented in this section, you also have uh, films from uh, uh, Nigeria with the Evi Omome, um, Still Water Runs Deep. Oh, yeah, and this is a really, and this is um, one of two films from Nigeria we have in the section, we're really happy to have in the section this year. And uh, and again, I think a really just, um, you know, another young woman filmmaker from who was actually um, produced a, a film we had from Senegal last year called Sandy Cinema, which we were thrilled with. So she's back with the film, and it's like this really, you know, rich, powerful kind of story of a sort of father trying to kind of, you know, figure out what sort of happened with this sort of son that he's kind of driven away. And and, uh, and I think just kind of, it's, it's great, especially just, it's, it's, you know, this, to, to kind of find the, you know, stories that we're not getting. And this is even quite different. It's, it's, it's interesting because it kind of has you know, uh, sort of a mix of modes, certainly, because you have sort of like Nigeria is a sort of big film country, but it has a very, you know, very kind of broad commercial style with a lot of the Nollywood films. And so, and this sort of, but this is kind of a quieter, kind of more, you know, uh, but but still, it still, it still plays, it's still kind of an accessible film. It's not just, it's not a kind of straight, grim, austere thing. It's actually something that has a very kind of direct appeal, I think, as well. It's a really sophisticated piece of work. Now I, I have to jump over to to program four because we've got eight to go through, and I don't want to keep you uh, too long. Um, 
La, uh, the tree house from Colombia. It was a good year for Colombia. I think we have two Colombian films. We could have picked a bunch more because there was a very, very strong set. I mean, it, it's kind of always, there's always one or two countries that kind of just suddenly have this sort of boom and it's just all this mm-hmm. great work. And, and Colombia is like, and so this one was like one that, you know, and this is another thing where we have a, you know, always get lots of films about young lovers and bad romance and kind of like people who are kind of maybe together but really shouldn't be so and this one was just like just knocked it out of the park it's really just, just the energy of it and the humor and the, it's really edgy and so i think we're just thrilled to have this kind of as, as kind of this in, in in program four is a bit of our kind of our relationships that films in some ways and and this one we just thought was just so powerful and uh funny and just you know again two people like a young man and young woman who should absolutely not be dating <laughs> whatsoever. Now, Jason, how does this contrast with um, Mon Amour, Mon Ami out of Italy? Oh, yeah, and that's a great one, too. And that's one of our other documentaries. And that's by a kind of real rising uh, young Italian director. And, and uh, it's something else that we're uh, really excited about. And this is kind of a, you know, real love story. Oh, God, God, God. So this, you know, sort of connection, you know, between this, um, you know, a middle-aged or slightly older Italian woman and this young Muslim immigrant from uh, Casablanca, I think. And he's they just had, they're just about to get married, but there's something maybe kind of giving her kind of misgivings or she has doubts about what they're, what's going on or doubts about their relationship. And it's just this, it's so, it's like the movie itself is just so gorgeous and just so, like, um, I mean, even just the, the, you know, every so often you see documentaries where the with the with the with the, the real subjects just have faces that are just so much more interesting than an actor's faces or conventional actor's faces. And this is too where I just found myself just sort of spellbound by just the, the, the physical appearance of these people and the story that kinda of comes from them. But they just, you know, I kinda of feel like I could watch them for hours. They're just so fascinating. But it's just, you know, it depends on because it's also another kind of love story that you just are very surprised by. What about um, pre-drink? Is this another uh, trans uh, storyline? Yeah, and this is a really, this is, I think, um, uh, another one by a filmmaker at Montreal, uh, Marc-Antoine Lemire, who's been doing some great stuff. And he, so this is one that we were just kind of, again, really wowed by because it's just this, uh, again, you know, it's, I mean, as, as I think that, you know, sort of culture gets more, more literate or more understanding about sort of the trans experience, we're seeing this kind of the films become more and more sophisticated and also just stories kind of are kind of emerging from within you know those uh, you know it's not an outsider's view you know as it maybe it was in the sort of first wave and so this is one that's just this kind of this you know two friends you know one um gay male friend another who's sort of just a one who's just sort of transitioned to female and and they have this kind of thing over the course of this evening and it is just so like sexy and surprising and uh, and just really kind of this, this, there's an energy to it that you just kind of can't forget. Like, I just was so knocked out by it. Now, Justine Bateman was not a name that I expected to see um, <laughs> in this program, but she's got a film called Five Minutes. Yes, it was Justine Bateman, uh, a.k.a. Mallory of Family Ties, are one of the, I think, better love, perhaps, of, of 80s sitcoms. Yeah, you know, yeah, I would agree up. with that. You know, I don't. I was never a Full House person. That was more of a '90s thing, anyway. But no, Family Ties, uh, full loyal, and uh, and of course, sister to Jason Bateman, who was also a sitcom veteran, who went on to uh, movie fame and making his own movies at this point. So, and we're just, you know, it's definitely like you can feel the Bateman family sensibility at work for sure. But you know, and this is one where we just were, you know, I was. I mean, I can admit to being like super excited when I saw that Justine Bateman had submitted a film. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, please be good!" And sure I enough, know. I was like, "That would be my <laughs> thought too." Is like, "Please be good." <laughs> <laughs> please be good. And then we saw it. And we're like, "Oh, this is so hilarious!" Like, it's so sharp and just really kind of hits this, you know, a kind of uh, a really kind of rich but fairly underexplored kind of comedic scenario, mostly to do with kind of parents and the sort of weird social kind of rituals you have between sort of progressive parents and like, and, uh, and really just, it's just, it's, you know, it, it, I think it really escalates. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, pretty fun and smart for a couple opening minutes. And then once it starts to you know, see where it's going, it just is, it's really, really kills. So we're thrilled to have that here. Yeah. Parents talking about their kids at school. So, um, 
always an interesting subject with helicopter parents these days. <laughs> <laughs> We're way too, way, way too involved with their lives. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, let's jump over to Program 5 and uh, Michelle Latimer. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know her name from Imaginative, but from other works as well. Uh, her piece is uh, Nuka. How do you pronounce that? Nuka? I think Nuka. Nuka? Nuka? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, this is a really, this is a stunning piece. I mean, Michelle um, is uh, really well known as an actor, and now as a filmmaker too. And she's been uh, having a great, um, you know, great attention for uh, the series Rise that she was doing for Viceland. And this is kind of a, a, a akin to that. I think this is a, a piece also that's part of a new series. I think by um, Laura, Laura Poitras and AJ Schnack, sort of uh, big American documentary filmmakers. Who uh, and she's done this one for them, and it's. it's basically a sort of set of landscapes in North Dakota that shows you kind of like the sort of kind of almost like haunting views of sort of um, resource extraction in North Dakota, which, but then really makes this link to kind of the, you know, the sort of what's going on with a lot of the sort of, you know, indigenous women in the area and the impact really of the kind of industry on in kind of social ways. And, and it's just really kind of, I guess, really builds in power it's something where you really kind of, you know, see that the sort of this the, the the link that she's making between the kind of, you know, exploitation of of, of Mother Earth and the kind of the the, the sort of more in tandem with the sort of systematic um, treatment of, of of indigenous women, I think it's a very very stark and, and powerful piece. Even it feels kind of you know it's the very kind of minimalist. It doesn't doesn't hit you over the head with it necessarily. And uh, how does that compare in tone to um, the crying conch or conch? I think I would say conch, but I do feel like I want to say conch too. <laughs> <laughs> Le cri du lambi is the French title. Yes, and this is—I think it's—and um, this is like a, a, one of those films that you feel like. It, I mean, every so often we get one of these where it's like, "How is this only twenty minutes long?" Because it feels like this amazing like epic like it just has this sort of sense of scale and scope that's really astounding but and this was um by a filmmaker in montreal i think is of uh mauritian heri- asian heritage mm-hmm. and he has um done this story he's done this film in haiti so it's basically just this, like, this kind of very um kind of radical take on this true story of a sort of slave rebellion and, and i think it was 19th century haiti oh 18th century haiti um and just kind of, it, but it's really this is this really um, again really like rich and mysterious kind of uh, take on colo- you know colonialism and the legacy of colonialism and and kind of how it continues to sort of impact in these sort of places and, and how the history is never really passed in these places either you know you really do kind of have this you know this kind of uh, this legacy of the sort of trauma and and cruelty and all the sort of things that kind of just don't, I mean, they sort of live in the place. You really get this sense from that from that film. So it's a really, well, I think one of the big, you know, sort of Canadian discoveries, I think, in the program, for sure. That must be exciting for you uh, to have these discoveries. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, just, yeah we're just really thrilled because I think it's kind of like we get to be like the kind of, uh, I was thinking of like baseball analogies. We're like the talent scouts, you know. We're like the ones that kind of like go off to the, you know, the different towns and say like, okay, this 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 picture is going to be like, this is, this is going to be in two years. They're going to be making like, you know, they're going to get Oscar nominations, that sort of thing. But uh, uh, we're just, yeah, and it's great because I think it's something we we're, we're really you know very happy to be able to sort of kind of you know find and 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 find those exciting work by people who are just kind of like, you know, just really coming into their own as artists and and finding their feet and finding their power, uh, and and really just trying to kind of get you know have them kind of have a home at TIFF before they get to those sort of first features or, or if they've already done those first features just to kind of just foster that, uh, that connection because I think people and these are all filmmakers that we really hope audiences are kind of so impressed by that they, they keep up with and they see what you know they kind of they get introduced and they, and they get loyal to them Now um, we've got to move on to, uh, to program six um, quite uh, quickly but uh, sure. the, the burden is something that looks quite interesting yeah, and this is um, out of Sweden. Of our, yeah, out of Sweden. It's one of our stop motion animation pieces by um, Swedish filmmaker Nikki uh, von uh, Nikki Landreth von Barr. And this is 
delightful. This is like this kind of this. Imagine all these like, you know, and, you know, little animal creatures with sad, <laughs> sad songs, living in what seems to be kind of like a mall slash hotel slash uh, workspace where they're all just kind of miserable <laughs> and kind of singing out their sort of uh, various agonies and miseries in these like weird pop songs with like very heavy sort of auto-tuned vocals and this sort of cute little dance routines and it kind of feels to me like this sort of you know Spike Jones musical <laughs> with you know really? with, uh, with little critters <laughs> Now, another animated uh, short is, I couldn't stop laughing when I saw this one, Catastrophe, with this poor yeah. cat. No. It's like a, short, a very shortest film in our short program. It's like two minutes long, and it's just this, I mean, I'm such but, a But so much, like, is, so much is covered in this, I know. in this one <laughs> moment. It is. It's so, it's, I love that, because I'm such a sucker for like you know great sort of almost like it was just kind of like a silent comedy really but just like gags you know and this one just has this cascading series of gags and it all sort of starts with this you know cat in this apartment that you know is sort of been threatened by you know the the lady of the house that if anything happens to the precious pet bird then you know it's going to be hell to pay and of course things start to go very badly <laughs> it's just this sort of and it's just this kind of real like it's it's one of those ones too where it sort of feels like it's kind of like cute but it's really once you think about it it's like wow that's pretty dark <laughs> it, is, it is pretty dark but it's funny funny yeah. as heck now um employee of the month um it's a, by a philippine director carlo francisco manatab yeah and this is uh one um who played can and i was really excited to see there because i really like his uh, the shorts this uh, filipino filmmaker who uh is got a really again like kind of a kind of a sex sense of humor <laughs> so, oh love this it was, yeah this is just this uh, you know this portrait of this sort of woman who's, you know the former employee of the month of this gas station that's about to close and it seems like the kind of whole society around the station is sort of falling apart too so it's just kind of this one you know it's kind of like there's almost like this fantasy for anyone who's ever kind of had a job they hated <laughs> where they just wanted to like do all of the stuff they weren't supposed to do on that one last night of work. Oh, <laughs> so. yeah. Don't we all wish that? <laughs> now, jumping to Program 7, um, we have a film out of Greece called Preparation. I don't think I've ever seen a short from Greece before. It's great. It's really, I mean, Greece has been like, I mean, despite the, you know, massive sort of economic issues, I mean, there's always been this really robust, you know, you know, film culture in Greece, and and this is from a, a team that we uh, we played a film by um, another uh, filmmaker that produced. Uh, it was a film called Sandy Beach last year. So this is from the uh, same producers, and and we're just we're. I was another one where I I think it was another three hanky movie for me because I just left. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, it's, but it's just it's it's also kind of like it feels a little like some of these sort of you know kind of cool new Greek movies like where I mean because it kind of has this almost sort of absurd premise where it's like this woman who's like terminally ill and she's kind of like trying to prepare her her mother and her sort of grown daughter for you know what life after her and it sort of sounds like this kind of thing it sounds like a kind of weepy nicholas sparks sort of setup <laughs> but it plays like this like she's being very rigorous and very kind of no nonsense about this and she's writing lists and she's kind of training them but of course she, she kind of has to sort of learn that this kind of like the sort of stuff cannot be managed the way she wants it to and so it kind of and just and it's just one of those things that's just so like the the look of it is just so gorgeous too so it's a, a film i'm really excited about now you have a another uh, palm d'or winner um a gentle night out of china yeah and that's uh one that was because I mean, every year along with the palm d'or everyone gets to hear about but the best uh, best feature in the competition they also have a short competition and that film also gets to be the palm d'or winner um, and this is one that just, and I saw it there uh, on the big screen, and it was it's such an amazing um, power because it's uh, this Chinese filmmaker, Choi Yang, who's um, Chinese and works out of Australia as well. And he, uh, he's got this very, like, uh, um, visual style that's very distinctive, and it kind of has this, you know, it's, but it's really quite, I think, um, very emotional story, too, because it's basically about sort of a, a mother who's. Um, whose 14-year-old daughter is kind of, again, this sort of 
child that's probably been driven away by some things going on in the family, but she's just spending the night trying to find her daughter and just kind of more and more desperate. And it, but it sort of has, again, this like, you know, this really kind of austere, um, gorgeous visual style. It's not like, you know, it's, it again kind of doesn't get sentimental or obvious. It's just, it's just really, really stunning and powerful. And then you have a contrasting film like Homer underscore B. <laughs> yes. Uh, there isn't, there's so, of course a Homer underscore A. There's a, there's a sort of this series of things that we've, this sort of posse of filmmakers who we've played before. We played a film called Imitations last year from this same group of, of sort of young filmmakers in Winnipeg. And they do some very weird stuff. <laughs> so this is like, <laughs> this would, this one's kind of like, I mean, the only way to sort of describe it is kind of like, you know, it's just a bunch of people. It's as if somebody found a bunch of old Simpsons character masks and decided they were going to do their own kind of like make a David Lynch movie with them or something. <laughs> it's just really very, very odd. And Sounds very, very twisted. Yes. And it looks like it was like unearthed on some VHS tape that was sort of <laughs> buried somewhere for 30 years. <laughs> And then we have in Program 8 um, a beautiful film called uh, Lyra's Forest by Connor Jessup, who was a he, rising star, Tiff Rising Star. Oh, Tiff Rising Star. People know him um, from shows like Falling Skies and American Crime. He was amazing on that, too. Like he's just this, And Closet Monster, a uh, film from a year or two ago. Uh, he's this really, really talented actor, first and foremost. Well, not first and foremost, because he's really just super passionate uh, cinephile and filmmaker too and this is I think his third short uh, second one we've played and I think it's, it's really stunning it's just his, I mean he has this kind of very um, kind of this unusual sort of fantasy element to this film I think it's I mean, he's very uh, he's, he's got a very sort of pronounced kind of like I don't know sort of Asian mystic influence in this film too although it's you know it's, it's and just very haunting and very strange it, and and I think he's just somebody who we're always really excited. We're really excited to have as a filmmaker, certainly, because he's, you know, he's certainly a significant talent who uh, is kind of multitasking. <laughs> so it's funny because I just think we do have all these. The one film we didn't mention with it, which um, program is we have this directorial debut from Molly Parker as well. So it's kind of like this. Our one of our themes for the program this year is having these sort of notable actors uh, making uh, shorts on their own. Yeah, definitely. Now. Um... There's another Nigerian film called Waiting for Hasana. Yeah, and this is um, something that we've um, been we're really, really ha happy to have in the program, too, because it's a very powerful documentary piece. It's essentially a sort of first-hand account uh, of um, you know, a young woman who's uh, been kidnapped by Boko Haram during that uh, you know, horrific, um, you know, very well-publicized story, but just to kind of have a kind of a real you know, you are there kind of experience of the story is, you know, undoubtedly really powerful. And, and I think something that, uh, I think, you know, it's kind of one of those, yeah, I mean, just to actually have that uh, opportunity to play and, and, you know, and I think it's, it's, it's great to kind of have this program. It's thinking about how to have a program that kind of has really weird little animations and this really like heavy duty high impact kind of documentary work too like it's really thrilling to kind of have this range of material but I think that that's something I think that the kind of we get to do with the program because it's kind of like we, we do have the opportunity to play this, this you know huge variety of things and, and somehow it doesn't you know somehow it fits together I promise <laughs> yeah, you have a, in each program. There's a good mix of emotions um, that are there, from very serious to light comedy. And in program eight, one that fascinates me is the death, dad, and son. Yeah, and that's hilarious. Did you, did you enjoy it? Did you get to see it? Yet? I haven't. I haven't seen it. <laughs> it's really, it's very charming. And I think if you like catastrophe, if you like the sort of black comedy of that, you'll really go for this one too. Ooh, can't it's wait just, then. <laughs> I know. It's, and it's, I think, an adaptation of a, of a you know, of a graphic novella type thing that was written by one of the filmmakers um, who goes under the name of Winchless, and he's a very, like, very well-known um, French comics guy and animator, and he was um, the co-director in Persepolis. Do you remember Persepolis from oh, yeah. years ago? Mm -hmm. So and this one's kind of got a more of a sort of early Tim Burton feel where it kind of has this death. The Grim Reaper is this kind of like kind of a sad family man widower it's kind of has this son he doesn't really understand or know what you know kind of connect with and the, and the, the little <laughs> even death, death has a problem with teenagers yes. 
Like, he's totally, <laughs> the son just has, he just doesn't seem to comprehend what his family's role is in the universe at all. So he kind of gets stuck on this idea of being a guardian angel who helps people. And this does not go well for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jason, thank you so much for running through some of these films with me. Shortcuts um, at the Toronto International Film Festival and tickets go, public tickets go on sale September 4th at 10 a.m. For all information, all the details, go to www.tiff.net, www.tiff.net. And Jason, um, have a wonderful time at the festival this year. And thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much. You're welcome. See you out there. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.